I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Action stars are always seen as larger than life, but few have been able to cross over into near mythical figures. One of the biggest action icons in history is Bruce Lee. Bruce became cemented in the culture of the world when Enter the Dragon hit theaters in 1973. The tragedy is that Bruce died just prior to its release, so audiences would now clamor for any kind of Bruce Lee content after his passing. And one of the most beloved fan-inspired tributes is the 1985 film, Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon. The Last Dragon is one of those 80s movies that you think probably wouldn't work based on its premise. But like many of those movies, they catch that lightning in the bottle and everything works together so well that it becomes ingrained as a cultural staple. It has everything you could possibly want. A great soundtrack, hilarious side characters, martial arts action, and so many quotable lines. You have an incredibly likable protagonist in Leroy Green, played by real martial artist Timac. Leroy is a Brooklyn kid who not only idolizes Bruce Lee, not only trains in martial arts, but he is engulfed in Chinese culture. He unapologetically walks around in clothing influenced by Asian styles, cites Eastern philosophy on the regular, shows people respect by bowing, and um, even eats popcorn with chopsticks. Eats popcorn with chopsticks. Thanks for watching Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, please like this video and click on the bell to receive notifications for all of our new stuff. Now, back to the show. The plot revolves around Leroy's journey to seek the last step on his spiritual ladder in his martial arts training, the highest level known as the Glow. His teacher sends him to find a master as part of his journey, much like how Luke Skywalker was sent to find Yoda. The movie is the brainchild of writer Louis Vanosta. He first broke into film as a dancer in the 1980 film Fame. In 1983, Vanosta attended a 10th anniversary screening of Enter the Dragon in New York with his then girlfriend and the experience was something he wasn't prepared for. The screening was packed with Bruce Lee fanatics who were dressed up in his signature outfits, shouting the lines with the movie and doing some mock fighting in the aisles. He described it like being at a screening of Rocky Horror Picture Show. And this experience both gave him the idea for The Last Dragon and inspired the hectic movie theater scene depicted in the film itself. Sixteen years in the martial arts, seventh degree black belt, and four times world champion. Introducing Ron Van Cleef as the Black Dragon. We said enough. Now we'll let him do the talking. Are you crazy? He knew he had to give his main character the nickname Bruce Leroy, and that there would be a rival martial artist known as the Shogun of Harlem. His original idea was actually more grounded and grittier, but eventually he would rework the idea with the film's director, Michael Schultz, to make it a fun, comedic martial arts fable. His script would be produced by the head of Motown Records, Barry Gordy. Once Barry became involved with the production, the musical element of the movie would become just as important as the martial arts. When you watch this movie, I dare you not to walk away with it at least one song in your head. Gordy had a staple of artists and as he delved into the movie industry, it was a stroke of genius to include his musical acts in a big way, since this was the age of MTV that played a big role with America's youth. There's a dance show in the movie called Seventh Heaven that looks like it would fit right in with their program. And as an added bonus, you even get a few music videos played in the movie, including the top 100 billboard hit, Rhythm of the Night by DeBarge.
The Seventh Heaven Show is hosted by Laura Charles, played by 80s recording artist Vanity. Laura Charles is that host that is loved and adored by every watcher of the show. This includes Leroy's little brother, Richie, played by Leo O'Brien. Richie is a mega fan with a crush on Laura so big, he becomes an audience regular with his two friends. He has his mind set on winning a contest in which the prize is a date with Laura. Unfortunately for him, she becomes enamored with Leroy as one night he saves her life after a gang of goons try to kidnap her. The goons work for the other villain in the movie, Eddie Arcadian, who is a video game mogul. That's right, a video game mogul named Arcadian. See what I mean when I say this movie probably shouldn't work? It gets better. Arcadian, played by Christopher Murney, is a wannabe manager and is dead set on getting his girlfriend, who's a Cindy Lauper inspired singer, some television airplay for her music video that he produced. And he has chosen Seventh Heaven as the perfect form. When Laura rejects the idea, proposed to her by Academy Award nominee William H. Macy, Arcadian operates like a mobster and orders his goons to kidnap her so he can force her to air the music video. He's the typical 80s businessman villain, complete with a swanky office that houses a mysterious water creature in a tank. Meanwhile, the villain that steals the show and is still quoted to this day is Show Nuff. Shogun of Harlem. Played by the great Julius Carey. Just, just look at him. In Venosta's first vision of Shonuff for his gritty version, he was just a real tough dude from Harlem. When they reworked him, they made him into a cult icon. Everything about Shonuff was just a scene chewing spectacle. With his giant shoulder pads, his shutter shades, you just look at him and fear him as much as you're in awe of him. As sort of a throwback to old school martial arts flicks, his main motivation is supremacy. He wants to prove he's the best and is constantly taunting Leroy to address him as the master and desperately tries to coax him into a fight. As a pacifist, Leroy tries his hardest to avoid this fight, even going as far as kowtowing to him in front of his students during class. But when he gets involved with Laura and Arcadian's situation, Arcadian becomes obsessed with taking down both Laura and Leroy, and he enlists the help of Show Enough, forcing Leroy into a confrontation. The sign outside says this here school is for instructions in the martial arts. So we thought we might get some lessons. Yeah, what did we sign up? How many yet? I like to learn some kung fu. Come on. At first sight, Leroy becomes infatuated with Laura and, as stated before, she becomes enamored with him after he saves her. So, their relationship is no doubt off to an easy start, right? Well, while it isn't quite established that Leroy lives completely like a monk, it's revealed that he is timid and shy around women. When his little brother Richie finds out that Leroy had an encounter with Laura and wants to see her again, he laughs off the notion that he could get anywhere with her. In a fun twist of sibling dynamic, the little brother in this movie has the dominant personality and is the one giving his big brother advice on how to be cool and act around women. And Leroy is hilariously perceptive. You gotta know the moves, baby. You know the moves. Moves. Oh, of course. Why you teach me some moves? One of the reasons The Last Dragon works so well is because, as silly and over the top as it can get, it's earnest in its approach and everyone is committed to giving their all. This is even more impressive given that this is the first movie for the film star, Timac. Timac was a 19 year old martial arts competitor. In fact, he only caught wind of the open casting for this movie from his tournament peers who were expressing interest themselves. When he decided to try out, 
he actually beat out an actor that the producers were ready to give the part to, largely because he was Leroy. You can see in interviews that in real life, he's the good-natured, innocent, wide-eyed, excitable soul that can turn into a fight machine if pushed hard enough. Timax smartly played the role as close to himself as he could. He saw a lot of Leroy in himself, and being a novice actor, he knew his best bet was to just be natural. His co-star, Vanity, was also someone with little movie experience. She appeared in a couple films in smaller roles, but she had become more established in the music world as a sex symbol. When she expressed interest in this movie, she was looking to soften her image. Again, smartly, the movie played to her strengths. She didn't stray from the music angle and her more vibrant personality was a good contrast to Leroy's. Although, she does display the same wide-eyed excitement whenever she's around him. What helps bring this movie to life even more are the great supporting characters. Leroy's brother Richie has a confidence and swagger that's bigger than it should be at his age, which puts him in over his head a lot. He boasts about Laura being his girlfriend even though they have never met. And when she's in peril, he's quick to jump to her rescue despite being outmatched. His chemistry with Timac is great, and he has a charisma where he can own any scene he's in, no matter who's in it with him. And of course, he's got moves of his own. Then we have one of my favorite characters, Johnny Yu, hilariously played by Glenn Eaton. Johnny is one of Leroy's students who tries to emulate Bruce Lee, maybe even more than Leroy. He's even a low-key good doppelganger. Johnny, much like Richie, has a confidence that backfires most of the time. You could tell he has an enormous passion for learning martial arts, but is a little too eager to show off skills he's yet to master. Whenever Leroy drops some Eastern philosophical knowledge on him, Johnny can never quite grasp it. But when it comes to it, Johnny has Leroy's back. That's when he finally gets to go full Bruce on some guys. You got it, Johnny! Thirteen-year-old Ty is someone who is both introduced late in the movie and cast late in the production. This is because Ty is played by Ernie Reyes Jr. Known widely from Ninja Turtles 2 and Surf Ninjas, Ernie's first appearance was in the movie as a little kid and sidekick to Johnny for the end sequence. Ernie was a giant talent being the son of renowned martial artist Ernie Reyes Sr., who was a stuntman and instructor. He got Ernie Jr. started in martial arts at age 6, and by age 9, became a junior black belt and a national karate champion at 10 years old. Uh, wow! Of course they had to bring him in for this movie. Just look at those moves. His father was even a stuntman for this movie, and they get to have a little father-son fight scene during the finale. The Last Dragon was not widely promoted by the studio with their assumption that it wouldn't perform well outside of black audiences. Plus, it had stiff competition with Police Academy 2 opening opposite that weekend. It would still go on to open second at the box office with $25 million. It opened hot, but quickly faded. The movie would actually gain its legion of fans when played on HBO and other cable channels. These fans keep the legacy alive to this day and has been referenced numerous times in pop culture. In 1997, 
Busta Rhymes released his video for Dangerous, which features an interlude with Busta donning the show enough outfit and even citing his signature lines. Then, a few years ago, comedian Dion Cole went viral when he posted a picture of him on Halloween being the spitting image of Show Nuff. We may have to keep him in mind if they decide to bring the character back. So, why hasn't there been a sequel? According to Timac, one of the unfortunate things of being in show business is that deals can easily go south. Then, there's the dreaded idea of a remake. It has been reported that the RZA of the Wu-Tang Clan has been trying to get a remake going for years, even citing Samuel L. Jackson as involved to play Shonuff. Fear not, it's been recently reported that Venosta has regained rights to the film and is currently working with Timac on a follow-up. The nature of it, whether it be a sequel or a remake, still remains to be seen, but Venosta has stated that while waiting for the green light, He's had like 30 ideas kicking around for an appropriate way to continue the legacy. Unfortunately, for fans of the movie that hoped for a sequel with the original cast returning, it would now prove to be impossible. Julius Carey would pass in 2008 due to cancer. Leo O'Brien would then pass in 2012 with undisclosed details reported. And then Vanity, with her tragic history of drug abuse, it would catch up to her giving her kidney failure in 2015. Time Mac would go on to keep busy by making appearances in several movies and TV shows. He would also continue instructing and opened up his own gym and released a DVD of his teachings. He still goes around supporting screenings of the film and is partnered with Alamo Drafthouse on a number of appearances. Recently, Timac released his autobiography, and from the sounds of it, his life before and after The Last Dragon was a crazy, interesting journey. So check it out. Glenn Eaton would continue acting and supporting roles in a handful of movies. He stayed pretty low key and looks to be enjoying his legacy as he joins Timac and Ernie Reyes Jr. on the convention circuit as they celebrate this movie with the fans. Ernie Reyes Jr., coming off the heels of this movie, starred in the TV show Sidekicks, then went on to become a stunt double for the Ninja Turtles, where they liked him so much, they created the role of Kino specifically for him in the sequel. He would later make appearances in big movies like The Rundown, Rush Hour 2, and Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. All these performers, the spark of creativity from the writer and director, and the catchy music from the executive producer, all of these elements came together and gave us an action comedy fairy tale that transcends and gives us a piece of entertainment without an ounce of cynicism. It mixes in some morality, some spirituality, and shows, without preaching, how other cultures can mix, influence each other, support each other, and help each other find the next level. The Glow. There is one place that you have not looked, and it is there. Only there that you shall find the master. We found the master. Joe Blow recently had the honor of having a session with Timac for an interview. So now sit back, relax, and enjoy hearing from Bruce Leroy himself. So wonderful to meet you. Um, so this is uh, this was a movie that was. The Last Dragon was just one of those movies that I grew up with. So as a kid, my dad was really into martial arts. So he instilled that in us. So from a young age, we were in Taekwondo. And so that was just opening the door to watch all sorts of martial arts movies. So, you know, Bruce yeah. Lee, Jackie Chan, everything, whether it was appropriate or not, he let us watch it. And The Last Dragon was one of those movies that he showed me and it just you know, changed my outlook on martial arts from a young age. So for you, I mean, as a martial artist getting involved in this was the first movie that you were in. Was that a daunting experience for you? Uh, it was overwhelming because uh, as a kid, uh, it was uh, a dream. You know, I, I grew up with all those uh, superheroes in mind. Uh, after school, I would run home just to watch Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, all that. And then uh, uh, then I also 
when I was on 13, 14, when I came back from Europe and I was living in New York City, the worst block in on earth was, uh, or one of them, was 42nd Street in Times Square. It's like Disneyland now, but back then it was like porn movies and martial arts movies. Right. <laughs> it was, it was, and there were junkies, drug dealers, uh, pimps, hookers. It was all crazy. But uh, since I was so... Uh, and, and inside the theaters, it was like yucky, you know, like even kind of, you know, I don't know, homeless. It was all kinds of characters in there, but some it was fun too. Yeah, because there was a culture in the movie theaters, and so that's where I watched uh, these these kind of movies. And getting this role, being on that set, what was it? What was it like? Did it feel like a a big? Hollywood endeavor? Was it more of like uh, everybody just kind of pulling together to make a small film or did it feel big to you? Oh yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't really um, address that in the first question. It was very overwhelming uh, because of the whole thing. I, what I was alluding to before was a dream. Uh, never, you know, what kid, you know, comes from New York city and is not pursuing acting gets to uh, star in a major motion picture. Uh, they didn't have any, people uh, like myself that were uh, doing anything like that. They were, you know, before me, I think uh, he's a little older than me. Uh, Denzel Washington was doing a TV show, um, but there were no um, people of color or even, there was a, yeah, there was none doing any martial arts films and not even that many uh, in any action films that in mm -hmm. general. So, uh, it was a big deal. So yeah, definitely overwhelmed <laughs> on and, set. And being on set, and and uh, there's obviously there's a lot of action in this movie. Um, how much of that was you doing it your own? Were you doing your own stunt work predominantly? Yeah, there was a couple of stunt guys because I got injured. Um, and then um, on what else did you say? Um, how much of the work was you doing the actual stunt work versus having your stunt well, doubles in there. It was mostly me. It was mostly. just, some of it was not me. Yeah. And even, even there were things like uh, walking around the city. That wasn't even me. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you saw my face. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so when, what was it like being on, uh, being there with Vanity? Like what was just being involved with her in this production? Like what was her presence yeah, was like? Great. She was amazing. Like, it's hard to, it's kind of weird because uh, it's like dreamy, you know what I mean? Yeah. When you think about it, that, that era was very dreamy, you know? Now with all the um, politics and all, all the, um, you know, social media and it, it's, it, it, back then it was like living in a bubble of uh, this dream, but it, it also had a dark side because there was a lot of violence in the city back then. So it wasn't all... Uh, like a utopia at all. It was just, but there was a, a magic uh, in that era, era and vanity was definitely um, something that came from that. And the filming there on, and that violence being, you know, nearby, did that impact production in any way? No, no, it wasn't like that. It's like, you know, look, any really um, tough city has areas that, that are, you know, but, no, and, and there are cop cars, you know, that would be on set if it's late shoots at night and things like that. And this, uh, this film is recognized in pop culture, like to this day, it, it shows up in various ways. So do you, do you find yourself seeing that in places and pointing out going, oh, yeah, that's a reference to the movie? Well, yeah, people send me stuff on social media all the time. I can't, you know, it's, it's all over the place. And, and I, once in a blue moon, I'll, I'll repost something. Um, you know, you see celebrities um, posting themselves like on Halloween uh, or um, athletes, you know. Um, you know, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of people, yeah. And it's, uh, for me, it feels like generationally it changes that the movies that I watched as a kid, it's very different what kids watch today. Um, but I don't know if you, it was probably one of the references you've seen, the, the Disney movie, Raya and the Last Dragon, in that <laughs> film, the dragon says, oh, look, I got I the glove. I didn't see the movie, though. Oh, you didn't? Yeah, and I mean, there's a moment in it where 
the dragon says, look, I'm glowing. I've got the glow. And it made me laugh when I saw that. My kids had no reference idea. They had no idea what it was. I'm like, okay, oh, wow. Well, I didn't know they like, used it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, you know, shows like Insecure on HBO. There was the big moment where in the finale, they go to see an outdoor showing of the film. And it just shows up as one of these films that when I reference it to people and maybe they haven't heard of it, I'm a little surprised. But do you find when you're walking around, do people recognize you and call out the film to you? Yeah, it happens. Uh, you know, in New York, people are kind of the head is straightforward and, you know, they're busy, busy, busy. But, you know, you know, it'll happen, you know, here and there. And, yeah, it's kind of like one of those things was the most known, unknown movie <laughs> out there. I mean, it's even been referenced on, like you said, the East. It's a race show, Insecure. It's been re referenced on Blackish. It's been referenced on uh, Cobra Kai. Uh, I was sent that actually a few weeks ago. And it was uh, William Zatka uh, was talking to some of his students. And one of them mentioned my name. He said, shut up. <laughs> and I've met William before. He's a nice guy, you know. But I was kind of thrown off. Was like, why, the kid, why do you want the kid to shut up about The Last Dragon? You know <laughs> And yeah. that's that's a really good point with the with Cobra Kai. It's a huge show right now. It's a massive success, and it's really bringing a lot of uh, recognition back for martial arts films, classic martial arts things like that. If uh, if there was an opportunity for you to make an appearance on the show, would you be interested in that? Yeah, I mean, I had a bad injury years ago, and it was, um, and then I had some health issues after that. And thank God, uh, I've connected with someone that is extraordinary as a scientist and. And we're turning it around. And uh, I wasn't able to train for a while. You know, it was difficult walking, all kinds of stuff. And that came from a lot of years of um, combat training, sparring, fighting, and uh, not paying attention to some injuries that I didn't know were affecting my spine until it was a little too late. But um, luckily for me, it looks like I'll have a full recovery this year. And uh, so and, and what, why I'm alluding to that is because I kind of pulled away from pursuing any agents and you know i have a uh, agent at buckwald um, entertainment here in new york scott scott um, kaufman but that's a branding agent so as far as theatrically and stuff like that i haven't got one yet uh i i'm going to start focusing more of that uh later part of the year maybe in the spring i mean i'm sorry in the fall uh and uh, yeah yeah i would definitely be available for something like that and with this film though i mean this was a it was a pretty pretty good success when it came out. I mean, it was it only cost 10 million to make and it made three times that. Do you have any idea why there was no sequel? Is that something that was ever discussed back in the day? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I wrote an autobiography years ago, about five years ago, six years ago now, I don't know with the pandemic, right? Um, uh, there was a lot of uh, issues with Barry Gordy and, and Motown and, and then Sony. And uh, it looks like they were struggling along for many, many years and not coming up with a, a good concept. It just didn't get it done. And, uh, uh, you know, fans have been so, uh, you know, imagine being me, right? The, the lead character in the movie, every time someone sees me, they act like I was the producer, director, cameraman, right. and everything else. So um, I, I, I just tell them, look, you know, uh, you got to just, if it's something you want, you got to keep, uh, you know, praying, meditating, whatever you want to do. But it, it, it's only gonna, right now a really cool thing happened for Louis Venosta, who was the original writer of The Last Dragon. After uh, I think it was 35 years, he didn't even know his attorney let him know that the rights moved over to him. Mm. So he's the owner of the he's now the owner of the foreign rights, the U.S. rights. Louis Venosta is the owner now, and he's been developing uh, an amazing uh, story uh, that is very different, but it has. Obviously, this is 2022, sure. and uh, it's going to have a different feel, but he's been working on something for about a year now. Very cool. And like you mentioned, at the time, there wasn't a lot of, uh, between you and Denzel at the time, there was not a lot of representation on screen. And things have certainly gotten better. There's still a long way to go. Um, so you probably can't speak much about it, but this new project that's being worked on, do you, do you, would you have direct involvement in it? Or is it being looked at as something completely distinct? Yeah, I'll have direct. Person? I'll have direct. Uh, yeah, I'll be in it, and uh, you know, he's gotten me in there for sure. Awesome. And um, 
from from memories of the set, is there anything that you know, just any interesting stories or anything from the production, like anything that maybe was shocking or surprising? Yeah, a any good ones? I mean, the funniest one is, uh, you know, Julius Carey, who was a really wonderful actor, wonderful guy. Uh, he used to, I was a kid that didn't really know much about acting at all. I didn't know anything. I did some school plays. He he would always pick on me, and and I would laugh. And uh, he was I didn't know that he was trying he, he was trying to get me to be uh, you know because I thought he was very funny. He would walk around in character, so I would laugh all the time. And and he thought that would show up on screen. There wouldn't be enough attention, so he would try to pick fights with me. And then uh, it got to a point where he really got me uptight. And then I, you know, I stood up and I, you know, and he basically ran away from me in this, on the set <laughs> in his whole uniform because I was literally wanting to beat his ass. <laughs> you know, but everybody told me, no, take it easy. And that was just, yeah, that was the time when that happened. That was really funny to me. And that was funny. I didn't know, you know, he had a, a lot of acting training. I didn't have any, you know. And so for you, first time, acting um did you what being on that side of the camera versus watching the finished film there's obviously a big difference between what it's like there the scale things are probably going to look very different um watching the finished film how did it feel seeing that like did you recognize this is something that's that's special or how did it feel seeing the finished movie yeah i mean i i knew more about martial arts films than anybody you know i lived breathed and and, and trained at it and you know you know, as a kid, I was studying with Ron Van Cleef and he was a karate champion back in those days. And, you know, uh, he was like in um, the Black Dragon. And I, uh, you know, Jim Kelly, I didn't meet him till I was uh, much older and he was really happy to meet me in person. And, and uh, so I knew about everything about these movies. So when, th when they cast me and, uh, you know, putting it down and it came out, you know, Barry Gordy was calling me from, the movie theaters that they were test screening in, and he was just people going nuts, you know, he says, you know, just really going nuts in the movie theaters. And he was like blown away. And obviously I was too. He even called me with Stevie Wonder there too. And I was like, what the hell is Stevie Wonder doing there? He's blind. He said, tell, <laughs> tell Time Lock, I think it's a great movie, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but yeah, I thought it was going to be a big hit, but uh, I was told that, that it wasn't promoted to, uh, at the time, the, uh, white audience because they were afraid at the time to really show to me people other than black audiences and they only showed it on uh, you know maybe wbls local sh radio shows and and it went as high as number two in the country and then it fell right up because of lack of marketing and then people found out about it through uh hbo playing it religiously hbo was an amazing company uh picked it up and started playing it all through the 90s and then yeah, that's when, I mean, white, black, anything, they all are, there are so many fans of this film, yeah. I've been all over the country with Alamo Draft House Theater. I want to yeah. give a shout out. I shout out, they were been really, they treated me really well, and we did a couple of tours. Actually, this, um, was it the, the 19th and the 20th, I'll be in at Alamo Draft House, I'm sorry, on the 19th of this month, February, uh, making an appearance at that film. I mean, at Very that cool. uh, Dallas. Nice. And so knowing a lot about martial arts films, when you were first making the movie, like was, was obviously there's the Bruce Lee connection to everything. Was there any particular movies or martial artists on screen that you thought about when you were making it, like that you really wanted to kind of use oh, as Bruce inspiration? Lee. Bruce Lee, number one. Yeah. I mean, I was a big fan of Sonny Chiba, all the Shaw Brothers characters, you know, that you were probably seen in, Five Deadly Venoms and other amazing films, uh, you know, um, Master Killer, Carter Wong, all these characters, you know, there were so many amazing talents and uh, Bruce Lee was the top of the list, yeah. And um, speaking of like Julius Carey and just how his character has lasted so long and it's just like recognizable and just you, you can hear his voice when you're quoting the film. And it's just mm -hmm. a lot of those moments from that, um, what you mentioned, like he gave you a hard time on set was when he was not on camera. I'm sure. Was he very different than his on-screen persona? Like, was it like a light yeah, switch? That's or what was I was saying earlier. He was a very sweet guy, you know, but he knew that uh, he didn't want, he knew that I liked him and we were having fun and he didn't want to keep that. Uh, so 
on the set, he was trying to get that tension, you know? So it wasn't that he was being a, 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 a creep or anything. He was just uh, acting. He knew I didn't have any experience uh, at all. And I'm playing the lead. I'm, I'm in almost every uh, scene in the movie. And so the other big element of this film that's had a lasting impact is the soundtrack. So the, the music is just phenomenal. Obviously, Barry Gordy has a big uh, influence in that side of things. Um, mm. what, what are your feelings of the soundtrack of the film? Yeah, I mean, it's so funny over the years, you know, I was trying to be a serious actor after that movie and I was studying acting. My girlfriend at the time was a Lee Strasberg uh, graduate, uh, famous uh, Lee Strasberg. And, and I was learning the method. I was learning that method, this method. I was just all over the place, uh, studying the HB studios. Then I ended up in Hollywood and studying with uh, Milton Casellas, Jeffrey Tambor, Richard Lawson, and Jerry, Gary M. Hoff, all these characters. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I'm, I'm losing my track, my frame of thought. I'm sorry. Oh, the soundtrack. Yeah, the soundtrack. Um, yeah, I was trying to be the serious actor. And then here, here uh, I'm pushing away The Last Dragon. Like, oh, this isn't a serious movie. <laughs> this is just a goofy, stupid movie. Not a stupid movie, but, you know, I knew yeah. it was a movie, but I, I, I devalued it because fans, people would recognize me and I wasn't digging it. I want to be known. So I actually did an episode of a Different World and played a played a completely different character. I played a, a bad guy. Uh, it was a date break. Uh, it was an episode. Debbie Allen reached out to me to play um, on on a Different World, and uh, I was trying to change my image. and And people hated me doing it. They thought it was good what I as an actor because I was trying to get other type of work. But yeah, the soundtrack. As far as the soundtrack. That's when people started really saying, and the soundtrack, the soundtrack. So I finally res stopped resisting it. And yeah, yeah, the soundtrack is amazing. Yeah. Cool. People tell me all the time. I mean, it happens all the time. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, we're looking forward to a lot of people discovering this movie because it is one of the best movies that you've never seen. So I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, keep uh, doing your katas. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.